In today's webinar, we are going to learn about pocket key presented by Delzi Jaj and Ariraj Rajkumar. I am Ariraj Rajkumar, promoter of TSC and a member of WCRC and UNICEF India. Second part of this presentation will be taken over by Delzi Jaj. What was that before pocket key? Before getting into pocket key, let me give you a real life example such as TV. In older days, we had CRT TV, which is a huge insight. As technology advanced, now we have slim TVs who are very much narrow and needed. Same is applicable in satellites. Before, we had two to three story high building satellite and now it is possible to build the same features which was having which was processed by satellite the bigger satellite is capable by developing into the smaller ones what's a pocket cube so pocket cube is a satellite in a 5x5 five five structure, typically in a size of a cube, and you can easily fit it in your pocket. It's called a pocket cube. So, why pocket cube? Pocket cube is ideal for education purposes and it is small, cheap, and reliable. It's actually cheaper than a car, which you can maximum minimally build by $50 and it is easy to build in your backyard that's if you don't need much equipment to build it except you need some soldering iron and some uh, grounding grounding station and all the components are available in internet you can purchase it online and compared to normal satellites it takes less time to build let us see the difference between the normal traditional satellites and the pocket cube. So time of development, it, uh, the pocket cube just take months and the price is also between hundreds and thousands compared to hundreds of millions which you can't afford. And mainly pocket cube is, uh, is fascinated for developers and hobbies like me. So we can, you have access to uh, do research in space by developing by yourself. So, talking about first pocket cube, it was launched in 2009 and named as T Logo Cube. It was developed by Morehead State University's undergraduate students and teachers. The type of this satellite is 2.5. We'll talk about types in later slides. And the mission was to read the Earth's magnetic field and orientation towards the Sun. The rocket which was used for launch this satellite is DNEPR, which is Soviet Union, and currently it is no longer in orbit and decayed on 2019, February 13th. So, talking about general requirements, these are the four points you need to follow when you're making your own pocket cube. So point one is that the pocket cube shall ensure no deliberate detachment of any components throughout the lifetime of the entire machine throughout your launch, ejection and in orbit operation. So no parts or no unnecessary items should detach from your own pocket cube. Talking about general requirements too is that pyrotechnics should, shall not be allowed on board. No fire elements or uh, melting of any wires is allowed in pocket cube development because they could cause disaster. Talking about general requirements 3, materials that can be toxic, flammable or potentially hazardous shall not be used. The use of lithium ion battery is exempted from this constraint provided there is adequate prevention against thermal runaway. So you can use lithium ion battery, but until you have pro uh, prevention against thermal runaway, 
you are good to go. General requirements four is that pocket cube shall meet the outgassing requirements in order to prevent contamination of any other spacecraft during integration, testing, and launch. So your pocket cube should not release any type of gas throughout its mission, so that it is safe to for other spacecraft. Next slide. So about mechanical requirements, these are the three types of pocket cube you can develop. Based on your payload, so number one is one P, which has dimension of fifty by fifty by fifty, length, breadth, and height in mm, and so sliding back plate dimension is fifty eight, sixty four, and one point six in mm height. So back plate is used to deploy and detach from the launcher deployer, and similarly. When you want to increase the payload size, you can go with two p and three p. So the length and breadth is always maintained the same, fifty by fifty mm, and the height differs based based on your usage and your payload. Talking about the same constraint, constraint for one p is that your external dimension should not exceed more than fifty in length, width, and height. The sliding back plate dimension you see here is that 58, 64, and thickness is 1.6 mm. is used for deploying, as I told you before. This blue color part is well, is a part of the deployer, which is launched into the space, and you, the sliding back plate is inserted and deployed through pushing out out of this. For one p, the mass should not exceed more than two fifty grams. So now we'll talk about testing methods. So there are mainly three types of methods to test your pocket cube. Number one is the physical properties, thermal. Second is the thermal and vacuum test, and third is your vibration test. When you pass all these tests, it ensures that your pocket cube is ready to fly in space. So, in physical property tests, there are mainly three factors measured. Number one is the weight of all subsystem. Subsystem will be explained by Denzel George. And the weight of all your subsystem, including a structure, should not exceed more than two fifty grams or two fifty volt for one p pocket cube. The center of gravity is made sure the center of your of pocket cube so that it doesn't. Create a problem while launching it. Momentum of inertia is also measured. In thermal and vacuum test, the purpose of thermal and vacuum test is to demonstrate that the system are able to survey without loss of integrity or functionality. The thermal loss experienced during the space mission is between minus thirty to plus sixty degrees centigrade, and the vacuum pressure is. Differed between ten to six millibar. So when your pocket cube is put under this stress, it should not black out while functioning. So it is capable of this sending your pocket cube to space. And so vibration test is the third type of test, and it's a mechanical test to demonstrate the primary structure. And all electronic and mechanical component can withstand the vibration and loads experienced during launch and deployment. So your pocket cube is placed in a table. It moves in x, y, and z, shaking the table between five hertz to one forty hertz. This test is done to test all the integration of the structure is strong and doesn't uh, come out when you launch it. Um, in, we'll talk about previously used payloads so that you can get an idea to de develop your own pocket cube. Number one is Cube Scout S1, which was designed by University of Maryland. It flew a test fine sun sensor to determine the dynamic altitude. It, mo 
and monitor the change in rotation of pocket group as a function of changing moment of inertia during solar panel or deorbiter. This is a two key set pocket cube set light. So pocket cube two number two is T logo cube CS array, which was combinedly developed by Sonoma State University and Moret State University student. It was launched to measure the value of such as battery, current and voltage, onboard temperature, solar panel voltage, internal external temperature, providing the telemetry for the satellite team ground station. So this is one idea to develop your own pocket cube because it is very cheap to purchase these types of sensors and demonstrate this ideology. Hey guys, my name is Daniel George. I am one of the founding members of TSA Technologies and a partner in the WCRC initiative. Now as Hiraj explained, when it comes to designing a pocket cube, you have to consider four main subsystems. Number one, that is the onboard data handling subsystem, then there is the communication subsystem, the electronic power subsystem, and of course, payload subsystem. Now, when it comes to the payload subsystem, the design is totally up to you. I mean, it depends on your mission that you're using the satellite for. Say, for example, you want to test a new communication module like the Forces Sat 1, you can that communication module itself would be the payload. For the Forces Sat 1, for in this example, uses a LoRa module or you want to test a uh, new material in space, how its strength is, how its structure is. You can test that too, that would be the payload you can try. Also, when it comes to interfacing these payload to the rest of the satellite, now that's where the other three subsystems come in. So one of the key subsystems in any satellite, of course, is the onboard data handling subsystem. Now, this subsystem is act, it acts like the brain of the satellite so that you can communicate to it and it to you and you can control it remotely, it will control all the other subsystems in the satellite, etc, etc. Now, when it comes to designing the onboard data handling subsystem, you have four main factors to consider. Number one, that is the data processing complexity. So any satellite, there are few requirements that requires based on the payload that you are using, the conditions that is it it's orbiting in, and uh, what kind of other what other components you are using in the other subsystems. So this microcontroller that you are using in the data handling subsystem should be able to handle all these data process and still not overheat or. Uh, consume too much power. It should also be able to handle all the data processes, say for example if you have a payload that is a camera, it should be able to format the images as you require, it, or if you have a communication module like the LoRa module, it should be able to receive signals and interpret those signals and reply with a different communication signal so that you can verify that the satellite is actually working using that communication module. Then another factor that comes into play when you design an onboard data handling subsystem is the interfaces. Now, the interfaces in any microcontroller, it has a fixed number of interfaces. Say for example, the Atmega 328P, it has a set number of UART interfaces I square C and FPI interfaces. So, but then it doesn't have other things. It, these, are, these are the only three interface protocols that is available to the module. So if you are going to do a design based on this module, you have to make sure that all your other subsystems such as your payload, your the sensors in your EPS, the sensors in your communication module all follow this protocol. 
So if you have, and you have to make sure that there are enough number of pins in the microcontroller to take the data from these various devices. Now the next factor is the power utilization. Now any satellite is orbiting remotely. So it has a battery of course and it has a solar panel, but the energy output at, at any moment is limited. So you have to make sure that the power consumption by the satellite is minimal. Because in any key design, you have to ob obtain maximum output from the onboard data handling while not consuming too much power. Of course, it granted it, it can consume some amount of power compared to other subsystems like the, say the payload subsystem, but you have to be able to monitor it and control it. And now another factor that comes into play is the tolerance, specifically the temperature tolerance. Now in space, the temperature will rapidly vary from upwards of plus 80 degrees Celsius down to minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius. And it's very fast. So this microcontroller that you select must be able to handle this and yet not have any faults or damages to the microcontroller itself. Typically, most microcontrollers can handle between 80 to minus 140, sorry, minus 40. But when it comes to the satellite design, you have to make sure that it can contain at least 80 to minus 50 because in space, it's, it gets really cold really fast. So the next slide, what we have shown here is an example of the onboard data handling module that TSC Technologies has designed for its pocket cube. So this one specifically has a USB interface so that you can do serial monitoring when on ground. And once you launch into space, you the, you don't need this. You can do it using the communication module. But for any repairs while it is on on ground, you can, while you are testing it, you can use the USB interface. You don't have to go directly to the sensors or uh, you don't have to say use an FTTI converter. Now the microcontroller here uses an 8-bit EAVR RISC microcontroller, which is typical, but it's not that complicated that you would require a lot of computational power, but it can handle some basic stuff like a few sensors, maybe a, a sun sensors, etc. etc. You can also add a 16 JV micro SD card where you can store the program. So for any case of uh, any prevention or fault tolerance or say you want to store the results of an experiment, you can do that. So in this case, it uses the UART, the SPI and the I2C connection to communicate with all other subsystems in the satellite. Now, Another key subsystem in any satellite is, of course, its communication subsystem. So when it comes to communicating with the satellite, the general term, there is a term called the radial link. So the radial link explains what kind of link exists between the ground station and the satellite. So here you have the earth amplifier, the onboard relay, and then you have the earth receiver. So what happens is the signal transmitted from the earth and the ground station gets is amplified before it is transmitted so that it can actually reach the satellite. And then on the satellite, the onboard relay consists of these its antennas, its transmission lines, its transponders. The, so this satellite should be able to collect the data from the ground station, implement any protocol or a command that the actual ground station requires it to, or change its system status based on the command from the ground station. And then it should, it should also send signals to the ground station that can be either the telemetry signals, the communication signals that are based on the incoming signal from the ground station say for example you want to get a acknowledgement that is so you set a signal from the ground station the satellite receives it 
and sends an acknowledgement that is that the link is actually working. So this is how a typical radio link works. So when it comes to designing a satellite link with a ground station, you have to consider a few critical points. That is number one is the power that you are is available in the ground control station. Now the ground control control station's power depends how much you can add. It it tells you the factors of the gain in the antenna of the ground station. It tells you what power it is transmitting in. It it also allows you to know a few factors when it comes to the reception also. And again one of those factors being the sensitivity of the receiver. Now for various modules or various communication systems, the receiver sensitivity varies. So for example, the LoRa module has a sensitivity of minus 148 dBm. So it, that means it can receive power signal with power greater than minus 148 dBm. Also, you have to consider the signal to noise ratio at the end of the radio link. So that is the that signal to noise ratio. It actually tells you about how much noise is picked up by the signal as it travels through the medium. So, of course, in any as in any wireless communication module, between the transmitter and the receiver, there is the medium. In this case, air like between my earphones and of course the camera that I'm recording in, the, the air is the medium. Now, in any, as it, since it's not ideal, even this picks up noise. But what my computer does is fa filters out that noise before recording the video. Similarly, you have to consider how much of the actual signal and the noise is, com is combined in the signal that you have received at the ground station or at the satellite in both ends you have to consider both also you have to consider the reception level now the reception level indicates the power of the signal that is received at the ground station as well as at the satellite so broadcasting a signal to the satellite typically you won't have an issue with the reception level but when it comes to the signal coming down from the satellite especially since in case of pocket cubes the reception level is crucial if the reception the power of the received signal is too low the due to the sensitivity of the receiver you will not be able to pick up the signal and then the whole mission is at a loss so one one key mathematical equation that helps you in make calculating all this stuff is called the link budgeting so link budgeting basically tells you about how much the receive power will be in a theoretical manner of course based on the transmitter power the gains in the system and of course the losses in the system so that is the receive power equals the transmitter power plus gain minus the losses so one of the main losses in any medium is the path loss that is the loss that any signal occurs as it travels through the medium so you can observe that this formula right here tells you all about the path loss so in in the example of uh, the satellite designed by TSA technologies that pocket cube has a path loss of 54.71 db now at the when you try to figure out the receive power the this formula is typically what it's you what's used but that's in watts so when you convert that to dbm you get this one so that is the, the receive power equals the transmitted power plus the gain of the transmitter minus the loss in the transmitter minus the free space loss that is also known as the path loss which is the same thing and the other losses such as the receiver loss and of course it adds the gain of the receiver so in the example of the TSC satellite again we had a received uh, the transmitted power was around minus 80 dBm and uh, sorry and the, the received power was minus 80 dBm and we, we had a module of minus 100 dBm sensitivity so we were able to satisfactorily receive the signal 
Now this difference between the sensitivity of the module and the received power is called the link margin. So the link margin here you can see that what it is, is it is a difference in any communication communication system it is measured in dB. It is the difference between the minimum expected power received at the receiver and the receiver's sensitivity. So this is theoretical margin. Beyond this, if you receive any power, if you receive power lower than this, you will not be able to pick up that signal. That's what link margin is used for. So this, it considers into factors such as the receiver sensi sensitivity, the gain of the antenna, the receiving antenna that is, and of course the transmitting antenna, the power, the transmitted power, and the free space loss. Now, as I was saying, the module that we used in our pocket cube, in the pocket cube designed by TSC Technologies, is based on the LoRa communication module. So we use the SX1268 LoRa module, which has three main communication modulations, that is the GFSK, FSK, and the LoRa. Of course, GFSK and FSK are pretty standard communication modules, you say, so we tested using the LoRa. In the LoRa communication module, it uh, here we've used an SX1268 LoRa module from Semtech. It is a low power, wide area protocol developed by Semtech, which uses a license free sub gigahertz frequency such as 4334 to up to 950 megahertz based on which module you decided to use. So here we've used the SX1268 using the 435 megahertz frequency. So it has a maximum output power of 22 dBm and a receiver sensitivity of minus 147 dBm. So it has a standard SPI interface which we have shown here. So this is a brief setup of a brief explanation of the communication module that we've used in our satellite. So you can see how the signal is coming from the antenna and then it goes to the filter for 435 megahertz and then is amplified uh, with a low, no low noise amplifier and then given to the LoRa module. This LoRa module then gives the signal to the onboard computer through the SPI interface and this onboard computer then formats the data and then Perform any action if required, or then sig sends an acknowledgement signal, or the telemetry signal, or whatever signal that is required to the ground station. Again, using the SPI interface here, which is given to the LoRa module. The LoRa module modulates the signal, and it gives it to the low noise amplifier. Now, the low, no low noise amplifier adds power to the signal, and then it gives it to the filter, which, re which removes all other noise signals which is not 435 megahertz because we, we, we just want that signal we don't want the others now after it's filtered it is sent to the antenna and then it's transmitted down to the ground station now when it comes to the eps that is the electronic power subsystem of any satellite you have three main factors to consider while designing it number one being the power conditioning subsystem now the power conditioning part of the eps it is responsible for regulating the voltage and the current in from the EPS. So the ba any battery typically gives out a fixed voltage always based on its charge status. So, but the systems in the satellite require a constant voltage. Say for few systems require, for example, five volts. Few require three point three volts, and it is our duty to design a system where it constantly receives the signal. Now these are generally in it generally involves buck converters, boost converters and few other regulators. Another key aspect of the EPS is the energy storage and control. Now the energy storage and control typically includes your battery, your photovoltaic cells and uh, the control of the charging of the battery, the, char the charging module that is. So the way the battery is constantly charged by the PV cell 
when of course when there is sunlight on the cell and it, it gives an output in other cases when there is no sunlight the battery directly powers the satellite but when there is sunlight it it, it just the charging module is responsible for controlling the charging of the battery as well as the power delivered to the other subsystems in the satellite so that is where you have to maintain a balance between charging and discharging using the energy storage and control part now another factor is the power distribution part so the power that you have taken from the energy storage and control that is the battery is then conditioned using the power conditioning part after that part you have to then distribute it to the various subsystems so you generally use a DC bus and send the power to the various subsystems of the satellite. Now, it, it, after you rectify all the noise, all the regulations that you have to do in any power output, you can, can, you can construct a bus within the satellite PCB that, trans, that sends the power from the battery to the onboard computer. To the communication module to the payload module. This is uh, this acts like the veins or the arteries as an analogy. So this is a typical example of the onboard APS designed by us in, in our satellite. I mean there are a few proprietary stuff I haven't mentioned here but this is generally what it is. So you have the power from the PV cells coming to the battery pack and then Sorry. and then it goes to the voltage control block which is then given to the power bus so the power bus is responsible for giving power to the subsystems of the pocket cube which acts like so this power bus part typically acts like the veins of this satellite and then again you also have the charge monitoring block which monitors the status of the battery and decides whether to turn on or turn off the charging of the battery so this charge monitoring block sends data to the data bus so between each layer of the pocket tube there is also a data bus that uh, transmit data between the layers of the satellite that is, so here the data bus is gives the data to the onboard computer and the onboard computer decides whether you have to either charge or discharge the battery so this is an example of the simulation of the EPS that we have designed at TSC Technologies. So you can plug up to 3 2 volt 150 milliamp solar cells. It has a 3.3 volt regulator using a, it also uses a LiPo fuel gauge. Now the LiPo fuel gauge is used to monitor the voltage output. It, it tells you how much uh, power is given out by the battery it give the voltage that is given out by the battery extra it also has the eps here that we've designed also has uh, temperature sensors so that we know that the battery is not overheating etc it also has a power switch that we can use on the ground at the ground station to say before like during transmission i mean transportation to from the launch site to our i mean our offices to the testing facilities, we don't want to consume the battery all the time. So you can, it's a physical switch to turn on and off. Now when it comes to, to the assembly, as I told you, on the left side, you can see the data bus. And on the right, you can see the power bus. Now these buses are used to transmit both data and power between the layers of the circuit. So you have the sensor module which would come here so this is uh, assembly of our uh, setup so we give this pocket cube module to any institution that's ready to design their own pocket cube so you can just mount your sensor module here and the rest of the systems are available you have your onboard mod the module that i showed first that is the it is a combination of the onboard compute competition module and the communication module since the pocket cube is a smaller satellite you have to, you can't give separate boards for each each subsystem 
So you, you kind of have to combine layers. So what we did here is combine the OBC and the communication system. And then you have in the, in the bottom most, you have the electrical power system. Now, this is a 3D printed replica of the structure that we are going to house the satellite inside. So this satellite is housed. The satellite with the payload and the uh, solar panels go, go in the structure and then you have the solar panels that go around it and you have to connect the solar panels to the battery using the converters, the, sorry, the connectors that are shown here. So, in conclusion, pockets are the next class of small satellites that you can use for your education purposes, uh, testing purposes, etc. So it, it is one of the main advantages in using a pocket cube is the miniaturization, the cost, the build time, which is very low compared to the big satellites that you have, which could take up upwards of years in development. Then you can also use this for training and education, space exploration, communication services, weather observation and earth observation as mentioned in this slide. So pocket cubes are a way of introducing new people into the field of space research. So, so if you generally work on satellite systems, pocket cube wouldn't be that hard for you to make. But if you are new to the field, a pocket cube would be a great place to start because it's easy it's low cost and it tells you more or less most of the problems that you will encounter when you actually design larger subsystems and larger satellites. So th this is a very easy and uh, cheap way to introduce yourself to this field. And uh, if you ever want any more details about this, we include a lot of links in the description of this video about other pocket pocket cubes we also include the links to our pocket cube this is this the pocket cube bus so the bus means what it's not the data or power bus typically bus includes the onboard computer the communication and the eps so tsc technologies is actually willing to once we test it we will be selling this pocket cube module to whoever wants to develop their own pocket cube so that you don't have to sit and design this stuff you can just buy it from us add the payload module and conduct whatever mission that you would like to so i see, hope to see you on the rest of this talks in the wcrc phase zero part so have a great day thank you